classical architecture endures. It's pretty remarkable that we have an art form that stretches back continuously for more than 25 centuries, something that evolved from ideas of the ancient Greeks, was adapted by the Romans, revived and refined in the Renaissance, and is still used in many ways in many countries today. Classical architecture has become something of a signature for Western civilization. There's something that appeals to our sense of continuity and tradition. The image of classical design can carry some pretty potent symbolism. Today, it's not unusual to see new buildings, ones that are certainly modern or postmodern, sporting some ornament or motif that aspires to the classical tradition, but not always with the best results. Classical design is a system, a comprehensive system of ideas on how to achieve beauty, harmony, order, and balance. It's a common language for designers to share, complete with vocabulary and grammar, a way for them to communicate with each other, with their clients, and with everyone who enjoys the environment built around us. That may seem a strange notion today, a commonly agreed upon set of guidelines for designers to use cooperatively. Today, we seem to stress the importance of totally individual creativity. There are few rules or guidelines, but the cost has been high in terms of visual chaos in our cities and suburbs. Like any good system, classical design begins with the smallest possible items, the atoms of architecture, you might say. It inventories and classifies these elements, analyzes their properties, and sets forth a series of precise mathematical formulas that bring out the best of their qualities. With these guidelines, it becomes possible to create increasingly richer and more complex compositions to delight the eye. So how did designers learn to master these elements and time-honored rules? In the most architectural of ways, of course, they drew them. Hello, my name is Alvin Holm. Under the auspices of an organization called Classical America, I have been teaching what is perhaps the only course in the country in the last 50 years in architectural design in the classical manner. This is not an art history course. It's not a bit academic. This is a practical how-to-do-it course in designing classical architecture. We study the classical orders as they've been taught for hundreds of years by actually drawing them. All the elegant and timeless principles of order and harmony begin to unfold as you trace your pencil across the page. Of course, books have tried to convey these ideas too, since at least the days of the Emperor Augustus, when his architect Vitruvius wrote his famous Ten Books of Architecture. Later on in the Renaissance, Alberti, Palladio, Vignola came out with versions of their own. In the 18th century, there were the versions by William Chambers, James Gibbs. And the most readily available text today is by William Ware, called the American Vignola. This I would recommend as foremost text available today. Whenever you look at a great piece of classical architecture, you're probably struck by the richness of the whole composition. And I'm not talking about applied sculpture here, but the building itself. How a variety of forms are created, how they can change and interact with each other, how the shifting light of day plays with them, first highlighting one, then another. This richness is just one obvious way in which true classical architecture differs from the rather impoverished postmodern variety. Oh, they might stick a column or a molding over a blank wall, like sculpture, but even the untrained eye can tell the difference. The same delight, the same stimulation, just isn't there. What may seem complicated in classical design is actually the skillful use of a very small number of basic forms. You can think of these as the elementary particles of classical architecture, the atoms, as it were. These most basic forms are called the moldings. It's from these elements that everything else in classical architecture is constructed. Of the molding types, sometimes known as profiles, there are three basic sorts. There's the plane, the concave, and the convex. And there's a special category called the compound, which is simply a combination, as the word might imply, of the concave and the convex. Starting with the plane, we have two basic ways to get a plane molding. Either push it out from the surface, like that, or 
pull it in from the surface like that. This is called a raised molding. This is called a sunk molding. The two basic names for the plain moldings are fillet, if it's a small projection, and fascia, if it's a large. Now, these are completely relative terms. Fillet is a small molding relative to other moldings. Fascia, or band, is a plain molding relatively large in relation to other moldings. Going down to the concave sorts, we have three basic kinds, the quarter hollow, the half hollow, and the three-quarter hollow. Quarter hollow looks like this. It's just a quarter circle gouge out of the corner of a board or a piece of stone. That's known as a cavetto. The half hollow looks like that. And its fancy name is Scotia. The three-quarter hollow is a little hard to conceive in actual use. It is known by no other name than three-quarter hollow. You seldom find them in classical architecture, but in the Victorian period, they were frequently used in the cornice of an elaborate um, ornamental plaster ceiling. Of the convex, there are three sorts corresponding to the concave. There's the quarter round, which is uh, just the reverse, of course, of the quarter hollow. And quarter round is, is its common name. You can, it's available in any, um, any lumber yard by that name. Its Latin name, its fancy name in classical architecture is ovolo, uh, with reference to Latin word for egg. Half round looks like that. It's just a half circle projection. If it's small, it's known as a bead. If it's large, relative to other moldings of its sort, it's known as a torus. As one more, the three-quarter round looks like this, and uh, it too lacks a glamorous Latin name. It's known usually simply as a thumb mold. <clears throat> now these the the plane, the concave, and the convex are just uh, the elements. You can hardly say that one is is beautiful or homely. They're all pretty much geometry. When you get into the compound, though, you enter the realm of, of um, beauty. Compound, the basic curve is called the sima recta. You see, it's the upper half is like a quarter hollow or a cavetta. The lower half is like a quarter round, ovalo. The combination is a sine or a, a wave mold called a sima recta. Sima means wave. You see, it's, it's a portion of a wave movement. And sima recta means that it's a, a right wave or a proper wave constructed on the horizontal axis. The other great sima is called the sima reversa. It's shaped like that. And it does not mean a reversed sima recta. Reversa, in this case, means turned. It's a sine wave, a sima, turned 90 degrees so that the wave of which it is a part is constructed on the vertical axis. The last sort of compound is 
composed of two curves <clears throat> that do not move smoothly into each other. A shape like that you often find on a, on a baluster or a shape like that. These are known as beak moldings. And there you have the basic moldings. Individually, they don't mean a lot, but when used in combination, they can produce some very beautiful effects. Let me give you an example of that. This is a cornice molding. <clears throat> it was designed for, a, for the top of a bookcase in a private home. The ceiling is up here, goes against the wall here. This little molding is the fillet. That's the cavetto. And another little fillet that sets it apart from the fascia. The soffit is the lower portion here. And here's an ovolo separated from the cavetto by another fillet, which is in turn separated from the wall by means of this tiny soffit or fillet. Now that we've looked at the moldings, the elementary particles of classical architecture, let's see how they form compounds. Let's see how we can put them together into forming a full classical entity, the baluster. Perhaps you've seen in classical buildings this type of porch railing called a balustrade. A balustrade is a parade of balusters, just as a colonnade is a row of columns, or an arcade technically is a procession of arches. This little vase or bowling pin is the baluster, and it's something of a microcosm of everything that happens in classical architecture. Balusters may vary in how they look, but they always have certain distinct parts that are related in prescribed harmonious ways. Let's draw one to see how it works. Here is a completed baluster. You see that it has all the parts of a typical classical building. It has, it, it's a kind of microcosm of all the elements that go into all the other elements of a classical uh, building. It's like a little column because it has three basic parts. It has a, a capital, it has a shaft, and it has a base. Each of these parts are divided up in, into other elements, usually in, in groups of three. You see that the capital has three basic parts, the abacus, the echinus, and the neck. The shaft has three basic parts consisting of the belly, the sleeve, and the astragal. And the base has three basic parts consisting of the plinth, the torus, and a kind of um, elaborated Scotia. Now these are the components of the baluster. Let's draw them up and see how they go together. As always in classical architecture, we start by laying down the vertical axis of the center line. This is a, almost a ritualistic process. It's like centering. And then we draw a horizontal baseline. And we establish the basic proportions of the baluster. Now, the Vignola baluster, which is kind of the standard for all balusters, has a ratio of 4 units to 12 units. We'll lay out the width at the bottom, 4 units. and the height on a measuring line to the right of 12 units. Divide the vertical line into half, and each half into quarters, and each quarter into thirds, so that we get 12 equal units. That's the module for the baluster. Now we'll draw the width of the baluster all the way up as if this were the uncut block of granite or limestone out of which this thing will be carved and turned. The base assembly occupies the lower third, the, the lower, the lower actually, the lower quarter of the whole 
height of the thing, so that's three modules of the 12. The cap occupies the upper quarter, so that's another three modules, and the shaft occupies the middle, or six modules. The three basic parts of the uh, base occupy each a third, so we'll divide that into three parts and slice off the lower third to establish the dimensions and proportions of the bottommost member, which is a square block known as the plinth. And we'll draw across the other third, occupied by the torus and its fillet, in a ratio of one to four. So divide that interval into four parts, slice off the upper quarter, and inscribe the circle at either end to give you the profile of the torus, which is circular in plan. Then raising the vertical diameter, we get the face of its fillet, and go on to the next portion, which is known as the scotia. Scotia is a little trickier because you first divide the remaining interval into three parts and slice off the upper third. Then divide what's left into three parts. And slice off the upper third of that. That determines the face of the fillet. Now, we're not going to draw the profiles in until we've drawn the belly of the shaft. The belly of the shaft is the widest part of the shaft, and it's as wide as the whole baluster. Its center line occurs a quarter of the way up the shaft. So there's a half a shaft, there's a quarter of the shaft, and that's the center line. If you inscribe a circle in there, you see that it extends below the uppermost part of the base. It settles into that base as an egg in a cup. Having established that circumference, then you draw in a little circle there, tangent to the big circle, to get the little bead, which is the edge of the cup, in which the belly of the shaft rests. Then you can drop a vertical diameter of that little bead to establish the face of its fillet. And between these two fillets, you draw the scotia, thus completing the base of the baluster. Scotia, fillet, fillet, bead at the top, and torus. <clears throat> now, it seems that all things classical are smaller at the top than they are at the bottom. And even though the top of this baluster recapitulates the sequence of the base of the baluster, everything up here is a little smaller than it is down there. There's no precise rule for just how much smaller. It's generally said to be a little bit smaller. So let's just withdraw a little bit from the face of the, uh, the belly below and the plinth below to establish the height, the, the width of the uppermost member, which is called the abacus. Now, the top of this, this affair is divided into four basic parts, as far as measurement is, is concerned. Draw the next quarter for the echinus. Slice off the next 
quarter for the astragal. And those are the four basic parts above the shaft. Now the abacus is square and represents the uncut block. The echinus comes next and it's round, but it has a little fillet that goes with it and that, the fillet occupies the lower quarter, so you divide that space into four parts, slice off the lower quarter before you draw in the qu quarter circle, which is the echinus molding. It's an oval all. Then it sits on a little bead. Looks like that. And next we have the necking which is also divided into two basic parts in an, a ratio of three to one. So you divide that interval into four, slice off the upper quarter, fill in the, uh, the shaft, and below the little bead is a straight molding, a fillet, which joins to the necking in a quarter round. Looks like that. That molding is called the kanji. The next member is known as the astragal. And it properly belongs to the shaft. And it's, it's the uppermost molding on the shaft, dividing the capital from the shaft. It also consists of several parts in a ratio of three to one. So again, divide the interval into quarters. This time you slice off the bottom quarter, like that. <clears throat> Put in a fillet that extends out from the face of the shaft a distance equal to its height. And complete it with a semicircular torus, like that. It joins the face of the shaft, which is called the sleeve, with another quarter round, a small quarter round called a cavetto. And the cylindrical sleeve is joined to the circular belly by means of a, another curve. And where, where the curve changes direction, is called the point of contrary flexure. It's going out and it starts to turn in at that point. And that point of contrary flexure occurs at the midpoint between the bottom of the shaft and the top of the shaft. The upper portion of the shaft is called the sleeve. And that completes the, um, the baluster. Now the baluster supports a top rail, which consists of, uh, which is usually proportioned in terms of two modules. And it sits on a bottom rail, which is twice as big, or four modules. The abacus, the uh, baluster to the right and to the left are spaced one and a half diameters away from the center line of the central baluster. Now that's the baluster. The same principles involved in the design of the baluster can be used to design the whole facade or a house, a skyscraper, perhaps even an entire city. But the baluster is the beginning.
For more information on membership in Classical America or on the Classical America publication series on art and architecture, write to Classical America, 227 East 50th Street, New York City, 10022.